Welcome to Capital Link's company presentation series. Nicolas Bornos of Capital Link, and I would like to welcome you to the uh, corporate presentation series. And uh, we have with us uh, a presentation by Scorpio Tankers. Uh, just a quick uh, uh, mention of disclaimer that this uh, presentation is meant for informational purposes only. It does not constitute investment advice. And uh, the product tank and sector, as well as anything uh, related to energy, is particularly timely and a hot topic these days. So we're delighted to have with us uh, the senior management of uh, Scorpio Tankers. Uh, I will. Uh, we have with us uh, uh, Mr. Robert Bugby, President and Director, and James Doyle, Head of Corporate Development and Investor Relations. Very quickly, we'll start with the presentation. Uh, after the slide presentation, uh, we go to Q&A. Please, uh, you are welcome to submit your questions through the Q&A button at the, end, uh, the bottom of your screen, uh, and the management will reply to them after the end of their slide presentation. Please, we would appreciate when you submit questions to include your name. We do not want to have anonymous questions. Thank you very much. And uh, James, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Nicholas and Capital Link. Um, if we could please go to slide four of the presentation. All right. All right. Uh, Scorpio Tankers owns a fleet of 113 product tankers, which provide maritime transportation of refined products such as gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, naphtha, and other clean petroleum products. We serve a blue chip customer base consisting of oil majors, national oil companies, commodity traders, refiners. Uh, the company is headquartered in Monaco with offices in New York, London, and Singapore. We are publicly listed on the New York Stock Exchange with a market cap of $3.1 billion. Slide five, please. Investment highlights. So Scorpio owns one of the largest product tanker fleets in the world. In addition to its size, it's, it's also one of the youngest fleets and is comprised entirely of eco vessels, which are fuel efficient. Um, the fleet is fully delivered, which means our vessels are capturing this, this current strong rate environment uh, and, and the one ahead of us. And as a result, we have minimal maintenance capex, just uh, our dry docks, which occur every five years. And, and given that we do not have any new buildings on order, we, we do not have any new build capex. We have significant operating leverage, a $10,000 a day change in rates uh, results in $412 million in annual cash flow. The, the industry and outlook is extremely exciting. Um, the, the, the current rate environment is, is near record levels. Um, not only are we experiencing one of the strongest product tanker rate environments uh, in the company's history, but, but for the industry as a whole. And there's a confluence of factors that are leading to these historic market conditions, but at a high level, the volume of exports and the distance the exports are traveling has increased substantially. At the same time, uh, the order book is at an all-time low. So with, with limited fleet growth going forward, we expect demand for our vessels to outpace supply over the next few years. Um, strategy, the company's strategy has been so far to reduce its leverage, maintain a healthy liquidity position, and return capital to the shareholders. Our balance sheet is transforming to, to one or a position of strength. And at the same time, since July, we've repurchased over $191 million of our own shares or close to 7% of our float. Um, and we have been able to do all of this while maintaining a very healthy liquidity position. Slide six, please. As mentioned, we, we operate the largest and youngest product tanker fleet in the world. Uh, the average age of our, our vessels is substantially lower than the worldwide fleet and, and many of our peers. Slide seven, please. Uh, our balance sheet is, is transforming it, and quite quickly. In 2022, we expect to reduce our debt by $1.3 billion. And from January 1st through October 28th, our net debt decreased over $981 million, which is very significant. While we are pleased with the progress we are making, there's still more to do. Um, we have given notice to repurchase 29 vessels under lease financing. So far, lease repurchases have been financed with operating cash flow, 
but we have announced three new credit facilities for up to 391 million. And what these credit facilities will allow us to do will be to accelerate the repurchase of more vessels under expensive lease financing and replace it with less expensive commercial bank financing. So the, the, new, the new loan facilities will bear uh, interest at SOFR plus a margin of 1.9 to 1.975%. And this is substantially lower than the 3.2% to 5.4% margin uh, it's replacing. Slide eight, please. I think this could have gone in maybe the market industry section, but it, it's really um, exciting to see the development of the time charter market. Uh, time charter rates, duration, and activity have all experienced substantial increases. MR and LR2 three-year time charter rates have increased 60% and 30% respectively since Q2. Um, in addition, there's been a preference for eco vessels, which now have a premium compared to older tonnage of between four and eight thousand dollars per day. And the company so far has chartered out 14 of its vessels for a period of three to five years, which results in fixed revenue of 451 million. Uh, but we remain a, a spot market uh, oriented and focused company. Of all this, though, I think the most important part is, you know, the increase in charter rates and durations. Uh, is confirmed by our customer that this market and positive outlook can be sustained over the next several years. And I think seeing their activity uh, and their outlook reflected by that is, is very exciting. And, and we agree with our customers. Uh, slide nine, please. We gave guidance on the fourth quarter uh, at the end of last year and, and so far had done $45,000 per day for the the fourth quarter uh, on our fleet. On an annual basis, this would equate to $1.3 billion in free cash flow or a little over $22 a share. Um, if you look at spot rates over the last, say, month or so, you, you've probably seen rates at, say, $60,000 per day or higher. Uh, if this were to uh, happen over the course of a year, we would generate almost $2 billion in free cash flow or $39 per share. So quite significant operating leverage within the company. Slide 11, please. So since March, uh, and this is weekly spot LR2 and MR rates, I mean, since March, the refined product anchor market has been resilient. Rates have oscillated between 30 and $60,000 per day, even during seasonally weaker periods, such as refinery maintenance. And, and the confluence of factors and degree to which those are impacting our markets is certainly unprecedented. Uh, slide 12, please. So I guess what's different uh, today, many things, but what's the same is that the rate oscillation at the high levels we saw in the previous slide showing kind of the weekly data going from 30 to 60 and back and forth. It looks very similar to the rates in this graph specifically from 2002 to 2008. And, and this was the last multi-year tanker bull market. As you can see, kind of those rates oscillating up and down at high levels from 02 to 08. But I think what's different is the fact that we are experiencing, if you look at the red circles, one of the strongest spot rate environments in the industry's history, while the order book itself is at an all time record low. Um, typically, the order book will build as rates improve and, and oversupply more than demand leads to a decline in rates, uh, but that's not happening. So I guess what else is different in addition to this? Slide 13, please. For, for several quarters, uh, global inventories re have remained at record lows, and, and that's really a function of demand outpacing supply. Over the last two years, the US has drawn over 471 million barrels of crude oil and refined products, and, and globally distillate inventories have decreased over 240 million barrels. Uh, to avoid shortages, refinery runs will need to increase throughout this year as, as demand increases. And, and two weeks ago, we, we saw freezing temperatures in the U.S. Gulf that disrupted refinery output. Uh, utilization dropped from 92 to 79 percent, which reduced exports and rates for MRs in, in the U.S. Gulf. And for, fortunately, there was no significant damage because these there's a tremendous need for these barrels. And we expect utilization to increase output and rates in this area, 
uh, as well as globally in the coming weeks as, as refinery utilization ramps up. Slide 14, please. Um, Seaborne refined product exports, the, the volume itself uh, have, have reached record levels. Uh, product exports averaged 25.3 million barrels per day in December. And you know, with inventories near historic lows, refining capacity closures and demand increasing, product tankers now more than ever are being used to supply more immediate demand and from further afar. And we expect that can, to continue, especially as jet fuel demand picks up here uh, with China reopening. I'd say the, the impact of refinery closures in places like Europe and Australia is apparent. Both regions are experiencing record levels of refined product imports. Since lifting export quotas, China's refined product market uh, and exports have increased significantly. It, it's unlikely that China will be able to maintain their, their current levels of exports as, as COVID restrictions ease and domestic demand increases. But what is clear is that the barrels are certainly needed. Trade routes are changing. Exports are at record levels and ton miles are increasing. And the incremental barrel continues to become more difficult to find. Uh, fortunately, this year we have two new Middle Eastern refineries that should get to full production, Jazan and Al Zor, by the end of the year. And this will be critical to meet incremental demand going forward, uh, especially if there is an impact to a change in, in Russian trade flows. Slide 15, please. The EU sanctions for crude oil came into effect on December 5th. Uh, it initially reduced crude exports by one to two million barrels, but have increased in re recent weeks. On February 5th, the EU will implement a similar ban for refined products. Uh, while Europe has been able to reduce Russian crude oil imports, it, it will be difficult to replace one million barrels of, of Russian diesel imports that are going to Europe each day. We have yet to see a, a major shift in, in Russian refined product flows. In fact, Russian product exports to Europe have increased. Um, in the event that Russian exports are rerouted to different regions, after February 5th, there would be a substantial increase in ton mile demand. If Russian exports decline, uh, refined products will need to be sourced from further afield, leading to a substantial increase in ton mile demand. So every replacement scenario requires sending a barrel a longer distance, tightening vessel supply and increasing ton miles and this and this will drive uh, an increase in rates. Uh, we have not yet to really see an impact of that yet, but but we are following the crude market closely and uh, the deadline is coming soon. Slide 16, please. We expect refined product demand to increase throughout the year, especially driven by increases in NAPTA and jet fuel demand. Um, with regional imbalances expected to, to persist due to refinery dislocations, demand increasing, and potential impacts from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, seaborne product exports are expected to increase close to a million barrels per day and, and ton mile demand over 9% this year. And, and since 2000, seaborne exports of refined products have increased 19 out of 22 years, even during the global financial crisis. So lower freight rate lower freight rate environments have typically been due to supply. Uh, today, this is much different. Supply could be the most attractive part of this equation. Slide 17, please. The order book is at a record low with 4.8% of the fleet on order. And I think that's what is one of the largest differences that, that we've kind of seen is such a high rate environment with such a low order book. Uh, in addition to this, if, if you use minimal scrapping assumptions, the fleet will grow less than 1% over the next three years. But if you use higher scrapping assumptions due to the fleet age and upcoming environmental regulations, the fleet will shrink over the next few years. So looking forward, uh, seaborne exports and ton mile demand are expected to increase 3.6 and 9.7% this year, significantly out, outpacing fleet growth. Um, and I guess just to finish, you know, the con influence of factors in today's market are, are constructive individually. Historically low inventories, increasing demand, exports in ton miles, structural dislocations in the refinery system, uh, potential changes to Russian flows, limited fleet growth, upcoming environmental regulations, but collectively altogether they are unprecedented. And we are really excited and optimistic about 
the short to medium term in our markets. And, and with that, I'll turn it over to Q&A or, and or Robert to see if you would like to share any of his thoughts. Yeah, hi, everybody. I'd like to just sort of um, start with a couple of sort of misnomers or observations that I've, I've seen in the last sort of week or two. I'm hearing a lot of people talking and even one or two analysts saying, well, the VLCC market has sort of gone down since the, uh, the, the Russian sanctions in the last sort of three, four weeks. So why wouldn't the product tanker market go down? I think we've got to view these as very separate things. I think that people put too much expectation into the VLCC market with regard to sanctions. Yes, it was of benefit in ton miles, but the movement of crude oil from Russia to China is not as much as the, as the first of all, stopping the movement of products short haul into Europe, combined then with having to take that product on very long distances from China itself. So I think that all along is the product market that's benefiting more than the VLCC market. We did see a benefit in the crude oil market itself and will continue to in the Atlantic with, with Aframaxes and with, um, with Suez Maxes. The other thing is the VLCC market added supply in the last two months of the year, effective supply the average voyage was done at a higher speed. The product, because it, the rates went up from being low, so they increased their speeds, whereas the product market itself didn't have that speed increase hardly at all because the product market had been so strong for so long anyway. So I just sort of like to get that out of the way that I think that people are necessarily drawing the conclusion and are wrong when they're saying, well, the VLCC market's gone down post sanctions. So sanctions doesn't going to mean anything for the product market either. They had a correlation up to about three years ago. It was pretty positive. Since the, over the last three years, the correlation between the VLCC market and the product market has got less and less. And that's for good reason. We don't have a shortage necessarily of crude in the world at the moment, but we have a shortage of refinery capacity in the right places. And James, now I think we can throw it open to Q and A, please. Yes. Uh, okay. A lot of questions coming in here, um, Robert. I'm just going to take this first one. When you repurchase uh, a vessel on sale leaseback, are the price option price predetermined? Um, yes. So the uh, sale leaseback is, is very similar to a traditional loan. Um, there is a uh, amortization of of the loan, and you are basically paying the outstanding balance of the loan. Um, so, for example, if you had a vessel that had a $20 million loan at the end of a specific year, you would just repay that $20 million, and then we would then own the vessel, and it would be unencumbered. Uh, occasionally, there can be a 1% um, premium to do this. So one percent of the the twenty million dollars, but um, and that and that's really what we've we've been doing. Um, first, other question: Are there any limitations regarding the two hundred fifty million dollar buyback, market volume, max daily buyback, etc.? Not from the company that the although the company would abide always by the you know the FCC safe harbor rules, which means that we are limited except for one block transaction per week to uh, buying 20% of the trailing 20-day um, average volume, excluding the stock that the company or insiders buy. So that limits our ability to buy back stock. So for example, last week, we were only able to buy 259,000 shares per day. Um, but the volume was much higher last week, especially the last three or four days. And now this week, we're able to buy substantially more than that if we wanted to. The other limitation is that we're not allowed to buy after 350. Uh, and obviously, we have to abide by um, closed windows or material, non-public information, et cetera, et cetera. We can open we can open windows on certain things if we or extend windows. 
by making announcements, by giving updates on bookings, et cetera. Robert, the next question is, um, given the increase in vessel values and the share price, why not use more of the free cash flow to pay dividends instead of share buybacks? Um, well, the share prices, the shares are trading significantly below the net asset value, and with a twenty percent fall in the in in the last weeks, it's it's trading even more below the net asset value, and we think that the we've been very clear that we think the primary the best use of um, cash flow has been to pay down debt, which we're continuing to do. That's the, the lion's share is going to be paying down debt. And that we will opportunistically you know, buy back stock, especially when we see dislocations and especially when we see it less than NEV. I mean, there's really no uh, argument to, to use a dollar on dividends that could be used um to create you know permanent value at, at these prices and i think related to that we have another question and you know why aren't you just buying back uh i think it means a, a debt facility at you know at these at these current prices um and so one of the things that we did is we announced three new facilities that are expected to close in the first quarter that i highlighted in the presentation and these are your traditional uh your traditional bank facilities and um very attractive margins but really what we've had to do to robert's point with cash is when we buy back these sale leasebacks are the ones that we've announced so far we have to have cash on the balance sheet to do that so as our new loans close and say q1 of next year we'll have additional cash that's not just our operating cash flow to repurchase and refinance those leases i think that Imagine a sting where, you know, we, we've not only got the newest fleet there is compared to the peer group, but we've got the least debt there is compared to the peer group. And we've lowered the share count too. I mean, that will be an incredible place to be. And that's where we, that's where we're, you know, marching towards in these last positions because we're sort of delaying the gratification here. We're not doing big massive dividend payments. We have the new fleet already. And because of the phenomenal cash flow that's going on, the, the debt is coming down. Now that delay gratification, you know, whilst all the way the value to the shareholder is, is growing in a very short time, would put us in a uh, you know an amazing position then to 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 do really what whatever we wanted when it comes to you know providing shareholders with a return. Refining utilization is at an all-time high. In February, we have the restriction of Russian barrels. How are refineries going to cope with this in the refining down season? You know, potentially over the summer. Um, well, I think uh, it's still unclear you know, where Russian refined product barrels will go. Um, I think we are going to see um, a period where refiners are going to need to run at extremely high levels throughout the year. And, and even in that case, any kind of disruption such as less lost Russian refined product could make things extremely tight. Um, what we've seen, and, and part of the reason why you're seeing such a strong LR2 market, is a lot of distillate is moving from Asia to Europe. Uh, but keep in mind, that's happening now while Europe is still taking Russian distillate. So it, it will be extremely challenging. I think we, we do have some Middle Eastern refineries that are coming online, which is great for, for product tankers and for um, basically refined product supplies. Uh, globally, uh, but it could be very tight, um, and I don't think we've we've really seen that impact yet with with these barrels still going to Europe. Yeah, and I mean, I, I would add another thing. I mean, just remember the, the 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 world has wasted the whole of last year. The U.S. themselves have wasted their SPR. Nobody's built in inventories yet. It's zero. It's kind of lost period, and 
you know, various reasons they, you know, got away with it. But looking forward, just look over this next four months or so, we're going to see an increase in jet fuel consumption, you know, from, from Europe East, from the United States, uh, you know, across the Pacific to, to flights, et cetera, et cetera. China is going to dry opening up or drive up that, that jet fuel consumption, which we haven't seen, which is a major component that's been missing to the, to the modern product tanker. I mean, it, we're really excited on our desks to have jet fuel back in play. Then we're going to move into, you know, back to gasoline season and, and driving season in Europe again, where people are still going to want to get out post, post COVID. And nothing has happened to bolster those inventories. And that's all coming on top of, as James says, when, you know, Russia are going to be stopping their exports to Europe. We've already seen, you know, signs to come here. I mean, the, the, what James opened by virtually saying Russia has been taking more product recently from Europe than it has done before, ahead of the ban. That is sort of sig signaling, wow, we, we better get what we can now. And then if we look at the seasons, I, you know, it, it's, it, it's a great place to be. I think that it's so exciting now. I mean, it, it, people were asking us four or five weeks ago what we worried about. And then we were saying, well, things could get into a real crisis in the winter. If you had severe cold in Europe, you had some inferiority things, you could have rates that are so extraordinary that the wheels could fall off the cart in a crisis and lead to a world recession, et cetera, et cetera. Well, four or five weeks on, the rates are still extremely strong. We have all of these small things to come. And we have a situation where the world's second largest economy is going to come back into play as this year progresses. And I think that that is a, a very comforting to the longer term fundamentals for the product market. Yeah. We have a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to try to group them together. We're, we're going to focus on some more of the market questions here, but we will get to everything. The, the next question is, you know, can you share your view on the recent drop in the BC, BCTI index, which is the Baltic, Baltic Clean Tanker Index? Um, I think we covered some of this. You know, we, we had a freeze off in, in, in the U.S. Gulf and that disrupted some refining capacity. Um, and so obviously we did see those rates come down as output was affected. But the U.S. Gulf is still the largest export market in the world. And we think margins are good at the refinery. So we will still certainly see volumes come back over, over the next few weeks. Um, if you look at the LR2s, they've been extremely strong. Um, north of $70,000, $80,000 a day in the spot market, uh, driven by great triangulation. So a lot of front haul naphtha going from the Middle East to Asia and a lot of distillate now coming back. And then also you've had an, an uptick in, in Chinese refined product output. Uh, that was another question was, what is Chinese refined product output doing today? And what happens to it when demand comes back. Um, today, I think China's around 1.5 to 1.8 million barrels a day of refined product. Um, under their quota, I think they could probably do about a million barrels a day. So they're going at a faster rate. I think that makes sense given that they're just even easing COVID restrictions. And while that's very bullish for the overall uh, global economy. I think you will have some time here where they will have some excess export ca capacity and, and that's what's going into the market. And it's great uh, to have those incremental barrels. Um, going forward though, I, I do think, you know, they'll probably fall within line or on pace with where that, that quota is. And that's probably somewhere between 500,000 to a million barrels a day. Um, okay, Robert, some more questions for you. This is on kind of asset values in the company. Um, and Robert, what is your view on the latest NAV of Scorpio? It's going up. <laughs> that, okay. um, you know, you've got very strong asset values. I think you've read that, you know, in many different sources that, you know, the chart, time charter rate is still very strong. It's been very active in this last two, three weeks. And that's another thing you should build confidence from. We've seen charters come in 
and use any perceived overall weakness to to add length to their books. So the asset market itself in products is pretty strong. And um, I don't want to to preempt. I, I would prefer to, if I could, to you know more take this question on you know Wednesday afternoon on thir- or Thursday because Wednesday morning we're going to be giving our updated fourth quarter bookings and um, our first quarter bookings and the NAVs are extremely sensitive to the, the, the huge cash flow that's being made in the product anchor market at the moment. Okay. And, and, but, and then... uh, I mean, I can promise you we are trading well below the present NAV as you can see by our, you know, um, keenness to acquire stock. Well, continuing with the company, Robert, um, do you have a target debt level at which you intend to get to? Um, and then would you think about increasing, you know, the dividend or buying back more stock? Uh, how, how, how do you see the debt level and, and where do you want to get to? I think different people have, you know, different opinions, but we've got a, you know, we've got a whole sort of, you know, department set up with our, you know, board and senior management, um, you know, which, which will, you know, look into the capital allocation, debt levels, et cetera. It's even got a name. It's, you know, it's Project 82. And, um, you know, we will not be giving a roadmap to the market at this particular point. We don't think that's uh, beneficial. We have stated very clearly that we intend to use the majority of the cash flow to repay debt. That the second that, that, that we will also look to acquire equity where there is um, dislocations. We also have shown, and we will continue to show that opportunistically, um, you know, even we have a couple of older ladies, you know, 2000. 13 built 2014 built ships that we would even be willing to you know sell vessels to if to buy back stock and and, and accomplish our aims um to the degree that this big spread you know continues okay well, look, there's a lot of questions here, but I guess one that that could follow that I, I guess is so you you you, obviously, we've said we're not ordering new new vessels, but for for other industry participants, you know, when we, we haven't seen a lot of orders, in fact, the order book's at an all time low. You know, what do you think's causing this, and when do you think people will will start to order more ships? Uh, I think in the, a number of things caused it in the beginning. It's it's you know most of the product. I remember the product tank company companies were coming off the back of you know, two and a quarter years of its worst earnings in its history. And all companies were were under some form of, um, you know, cash flow pressure. So financially, they weren't in, a, weren't in a position where they were willing to order. Then since then, in the last, so let's say, three, four, five months, um, the math tells you that you should be buying a ship in the water as opposed to ordering a ship for delivery far away the the book the yards are, are very booked up in the front two two and a quarter two and a half years and the spot rates themselves are very high and the time charter rates for the next three years are very high so you're much better off financially in taking the 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 vessel in the water today in what's expected to be a, you know a multi-year high market then using that, putting your equity down at uh, high yard prices, earning nothing on that equity for delivery, you know, a long time in the future. And then the third thing that's been holding it back is, um, you know, yard capacity itself. And the fourth thing is working out what type of combustion engine or specification for the new regulations in the future that you're going to going to have to cope with and and a couple more questions just came in robert and I, and i think 
you know, people want to know what what the construction time is for these new builds. You know, if if Robert and James order one today, how long is it going to take to get? Um, it depends on the type of vessel. I think there's probably some MR capacity in 2025. Uh, for LR2s, you're probably looking 2026, but there could be a few vessels that could deliver, you know, in those years. But if you really wanted to significantly impact the market, and I mean order, you know, 100 ships or something like that you're going to have to spread it out at various yards and, and a lot of them are full with other projects so you're going to be looking at kind of a 2026 and and after um and i think you know one two ships is one thing but but a serious uh number of orders is going to take time and need need a lot of uh, yard capacity in different yards as well keep in mind shipbuilding capacity has has gone down and been consolidated significantly compared to you know 08 and even to 2015. Um, there's a question 10k change in rates translates approximately to uh 410 million in cash flow yeah so that's just our sensitivity analysis that flows to the bottom line um it assumes our break even of of seventeen thousand dollars a day which includes um uh debt amortization i think um, i think that's a i think if on that thing i think if i were looking at this and i could pick out sort of one chart you know that the, the that I think it, if I only had one chart, I would pick that chart out that shows the sensitivity, the $10,000 a day changes in cash flow. And then I would look up, you know, let's say Clarkson's day rates, and I would do a simple average between what modern scrubber fitted MRs are, are, are making and what LR2s are making. And I would say, oh my God. People are worried about a falling market. Look at all that cash flow being generated. Yeah, I agree. And and this was a follow up question to to that question. But you know, uh, are we anticipating kind of the current TC rate environment to sustain for the the next three years? And I think that's kind of hard. You saw the graph, and if we go back kind of to the the last week of December, you know, rates had reached record historic levels in the product taker space. But I think what we will see to, to answer your question is a market that will oscillate at very high levels, just as we did in the last cycle. It's not going to just go up in a straight line continually, but given the 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 time charter market development of that, you know, moving up rates on the LR2s and MRs, you know, starting in June all the way up through today with steady level increases reflects our customer's view of the market. I think that's the best way to answer the question yeah. as opposed to we, us saying it. Yeah, we, we haven't seen, it's, it's, it's very extraordinary to, to see a situation where, you know, we have a world where people are talking about recession and, and lack of economic growth and worried about worrying about headline demand where rates are so high combined with an order load book that is at a record low. And that's what, what's both exciting and difficult to handicap. So I would agree totally with, with James. Um, we're we're going to bounce around here a little bit more, Robert. But um, in the absence of a dividend increase, would Scorpio ever consider uh, paying a special dividend? Or, and I'm going to add to this question, or increasing its current dividend as well in that mix? I think uh, I, I think uh, both of those would would, would you know be, be things that you know would, would 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 be studied in Project Eighty Two, and I think that they you know that, that that alludes to one of the things, two of the things that we can do once we've accomplished what we want to do. And the company should take down debt at the moment. It should take down its break evens. It should strategically put itself in a position where it's got the best fleet and the best balance sheet. And the second thing is it is just simply factual that to use the surplus cash flow to do to to pay out special dividends 
or increase dividends as opposed to buying back stock now would be a terrible use of shareholders' money. But in the future, yes, an increase in a, a regular dividend or a, a even a special dividends in addition to that would, would 100% be on the table. And slightly different, but related to this topic, one of the questions was, what percentage of Sting is owned by insiders? Uh, to answer that question, I think it's around 11% is owned by insiders. So putting together the dividend conversation as well as the insider ownership, obviously uh, the, the the primary beneficiary of a, of a high dividend would be insiders. Um, and then we're going to bounce around to the next question. The, the question was asked, why are five-year-old vessels not, not more expensive than new builds? Um, well, I think what you need to look at is there's something called a resale value of the new build. And that's a vessel that's, say, zero years old or about to be delivered within a year. Uh, and you do see a significant premium for those vessels over new builds. You're not going to see probably the five-year-old vessel uh, be higher than the new build because of, of five years of depreciation. Um, but what you could look at, for example, is how have the five-year vessels changed and how do the five-year-old values compare to historical new builds? Because in some cases, you might find yourself that a five-year-old vessel is close to what somebody paid for a new build a few years ago. Um, but we definitely have seen the um, the current one-year-old or less than one-year-old values increase significantly and the other side on the new builds is you're looking at a longer delivery time which isn't always factored into a historical time series of prices um given the earnings outlook for product tankers and the deleveraging would you consider acquiring some secondhand vessels with free cash flow no it's the same you know the, the uh, that would be a uh miserable use of cash too compared to buying back your own stock we i mean adding one or two vessels to to our fleet is really not going to do very much at all i and think you're certainly, like this. Uh, certainly adding vessels that are older than the the, the fleet we have would, would 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 not be good how did the name project 82 come about it's well, that would, that's a secret. Okay. You, are, um, you either know how it came about and you're, you're part of Project 82 or you don't. Okay. <laughs> here's, a, here's a more serious one. What do you think is the biggest threat to the, to the market and the story today? I think that's a very good question. I think we've moved. As I said, you know, a few weeks ago, we were very, very worried about, you know, what on earth was going to to you know, happen and you could get some really extreme positions. I think that the, the economic outlooks have, let's say, got have got better. And so now we're left with the, you know, the, the biggest threat that's always there, which is the unknown, you know, something really sort of wacky happening that's just not guessed, not known by anybody right now who could who could guess what to do. Uh, I think that we should still be cognizant and aware that we, you know, we, we have savers being rattled by, you know, various superpowers around the world. We have, you know, potential instability in in governments and and types of of, of government going around as well. So, you know, the, these are the these are the major threats. Okay. And this is, we're at, we're out of time. We have one minute left. Um, and thank you for all your questions. If we didn't get to some of them, please um, feel free to email me and, and I'll, I'm happy to answer them. Some of them um, I couldn't completely understand, but um, final question is what's the biggest difference today, Robert, in, in your career and, and what you're seeing in the market? In this extraordinary phenomenon that, um, your new building order book is at, at, at a, a record low combined with increases in regulation, a actual shipyard order book that is full up for 
you know, as we as we went through for the next you know two and a half, and in some categories three years, the supply side is is not really being recognised by investors or, or or stressed enough by analysts, simply because we work in a world that is so focused with the here and now. So everybody is focused on the rate of here and now, as opposed to looking forward. But that that supply side is you know, is, is right there. It's an anvil. It's not moving anywhere. And the, uh, you know, the hammer is the demand side. And that's very exciting because you've got these huge shifts going on finally in refineries. You know, refineries opening up that require seaborne, you know, movement and refineries closing that are being close to the traditional customer that's it means that your ton miles are expanding, even if your headline ton mile miles are, you know, flat. And now we've added this other equation that there's a very good chance that by the end of this year that the, you know, COVID is something that on a world basis is in the back mirror. And hopefully, you know, by the end of the year, the you know, the two biggest economies are starting to function and move forward again. And, you know, and then we, we have the rest, we have a good, a good general economic background to look forward. So we have this crazy situation compared to every other time in, in my career when we've had super rates. Normally, when you've got really strong rates, you've got a supply side that's been growing like crazy. You've got record numbers of ships on order. And you've got a demand side where everything is firing on all cylinders. So all you're doing is looking from the top of this cliff out to a very, very large fall below you. Whereas here, we have high rates, but there are kind of nice mattresses and trampolines to bounce off. You know, in addition to that, inventories are very large. I mean, it's crazy to think we're in this situation and nobody has taken advantage of the weak demand by building their inventory. I think there's a, a connection issue, Robert, but. Um, Can you hear or not, James? Yep, you're, you're good. Oh, you finished on inventories. Yeah, I was just going to say, and then the final thing that's different is to be in a company like Sting. Well, we have no capex for new buildings, no requirement to buy ships. We can just focus on return, and that, and to be in a time where management is, you know, is the largest shareholder. That's the biggest difference. Well, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Capital Link. Um, I, there's a couple of questions we couldn't get to. Please feel free to to email me. Um, we're happy to take them. Um, and thank you all for your interest. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Nicholas. And thanks again. Well, Robert and uh, James, thank you very much. Clearly, as we have all seen, this has been another terrific presentation with uh, an avalanche of questions. Uh, so thank you all for joining. As a reminder that this presentation will be available as a, an archived replay accessible upon demand so thank you uh, to everybody for being with us and thank you robert and james thank you take care